What else goes on? When you're spinning under a malfunction, the blood's draining down to the bottom of your body. Your feet are highly oxygenated. Inside your brain, you start suffering with hypoxia. Hypoxia brings on euphoria. You think you're dominating the situation you're in. You're not really able to calculate the problems you have while you're spinning up. Behind our ear here, there are the canals with the, the fluid and the hairs that help us. They're basically our artificial horizon. They keep us on the straight and level. When you're spinning around, like playing a game, sticking your head on a stick and running around, you can't go straight because the information that's coming from here, your balance system going to the brain is giving you false information. So all of these things with hypoxia from the lack of oxygen in your, in your brain, you're running on low oxane fuel, the false information coming in from your balance system, your eyes see where the horizon is, but your brain's telling you, I'm receiving alternate information there. All of this going on while we're coming up towards the planet at a high speed, if we haven't well rehearsed and we've got our emergency procedure well practiced, we could get ourselves into trouble. So that's deliberately practice. Know your gear is a great way of being able to control your gear and yourself. handles are pulled, the job is not finished. People think when I pull my handles, I'm done. I've done everything I can. I can reach for the remote control, update my Facebook profile or have a cup of tea. You're still on duty. Once your handles are pulled, stay symmetrical to give your reserve the best opportunity to get its deployment sorted without the risers being asymmetric. Three-ring system is basically a lever, short arm, long arm, short arm, long arm, short arm. Hmm, this one's looking pretty similar. Here we have a different design. Notice the middle ring is way longer, giving us a longer lever. So we'd think that this is a more effective through ring system. The top ring looks like it's in a very mechanically advantaged look position, but what you have to consider as well is during an extremely high force when this riser is experiencing over 1,600 kilos going through it during a spike on a deployment, the webbing itself behind here of your main riser is going to be stretching. This design is compensating for that. So when the riser goes to its maximum load, this small ring moves into its most mechanical advantage and the resultant force on the soft loop is reduced. This one here, because we've got quite a significant increase in length between the bottom of the riser and where the grommet's located, the riser itself is going to be stretching even more. So um, at the very top end, that's a debatable riser design. Seems to work just fine though. If you really want to get efficient, then you move to man size risers and rings. You could have mini risers with standard rings on there. And here it's larger rings, more mechanical advantage. Separating yourself from your main parachute or parts of it require some other tools occasionally. These are all available 
and should be carried. They don't need to be super expensive. This one's originally designed for uh, industrial fishing vessels, I believe, for gutting fish. Yes, it's plastic, so if you're jumping in the North or South Pole and minus 50 degrees, the plastic will be brittle. The metal is what's really important um, and how you use it. So I'd really recommend you carry at least one of these just in case. We saw one being used earlier uh, last season. Somebody demonstrated the use of a safety knife, a line separation device. We can't call them a knife if you're going through an airport nowadays. You'll miss your flight discussing uh, security with the police. But somebody saved themselves because they were carrying one of these. Um, the three ring system got snagged by the housing. Uh, it's mind boggling to understand how that might have happened. But you'll see some photographs where these have been misassembled and this housing passes in front. It's also possible we never saw that rig uh, before the jump. But it's also possible that this was not in the correct place. It wasn't sitting right behind there. So if it was misassembled and the cutaway happened, that ring got locked by the housing. So the only way to separate yourself was with a knife. Remember, when you've got these beautiful risers with the housings in them, you're not going to be able to cut through that metal. So if you do need to cut yourself free, you're going above the tube on the riser. So common misinterpretations of uh, assembling a three ring system. Can you spot what's going on here? Are there errors? That's one. Here's another one. Can you see where the problem is? If there's just one or two. And here's another one. Everything look all right to you? Let's go through this. Housing on the right hand side, coming up the right hand side. Three ring system is assembled correctly. This is correct. Good to go. The next one we have here. What do you spot? This looks good. I'm happy with that. This one here, it doesn't quite look correct, does it? Effectively, it's a two ring system and it could get really nasty when the loads start being applied to this riser. So let's pull that cable out and assemble it the correct way. Now doesn't that look better? And our third example here. Do you spot anything unusual? This one looks good. This one, we're back to being a two ring system instead of a three ring system and the housing is rooted on the wrong side. So let's whip this out and assemble it the appropriate way.
it's really not difficult to do but as a result it's really not difficult to do wrong either if you're not paying attention you see how that looks different now good to go so this is an example of a poor handle fitted to the main lift web uh, suboptimal style it's been fitted to the main lift web with a, a biased to have the handle want to retract itself underneath the main lift web occasionally we find that so when you're fitting your handle especially if it doesn't have the stiffener but even if it does have the stiffener that little piece of plastic that we talked about this is a super thin handle no stiffener in there when you're assembling it allow the handle to sit relaxed and if you are going to introduce a turn one turn is fine we're not turning this into a corkscrew but assemble it to the velcro so that the handle has a slight biased outboard rather than inboard actually in flight if you ever see videos or photos of people in flight these handles tend to sit out like the fins on a fish anyway unless you have a proper handle like this because it's going deep into the main lift web it tends to sit closer to your body and there's less chance of being caught on something but uh, there's no real need to have a piece of plastic inside there if you understand the correct way to fit the handle to the velcro so some manufacturers choose to use nothing at all others choose a small finger sized piece of stiffener and others choose a huge piece of plastic stiffener I'm not a fan of these because if you imagine here my hand going around I can get good grip my fingers curve all the way around and I can really put some power into this if I need to when you have a handle like this I'm not getting my fingers all the way around because this plate stops me from getting there so had this been assembled the other way around then I can really get my fingers around it nicely and I could get a good grip the other reason I don't like these large plastic pieces is because they turn the velcro into a solid structure velcro is this wonderful material it should be officially called touch fastening fabric but it's a flexible fabric so if the main lift web where your handle is attached is flexed this will stay attached when you have the velcro stitched down onto a rigid piece and the main lift web moves your velcro detaches potentially a bit too easily and you have a handle off in flight uh, prematurely which could lead to some inconveniences for you now if you have deluxe stainless steel rings um, you're unlikely to have problems occasionally as you rotate these through you'll find a sharp edge that was introduced during manufacture and you don't want that inside cutting tapes these are looking great old rusty rings these are high carbon steel with a cadmium plating um, <laughs> this was exposed to quite a high load and the metal you could say is not quite strong enough so when you look at it sideways although it seems to be a circle here from the side it's quite distorted okay the metal was too soft it couldn't cope with the forces during the deployment occasionally that happens with incorrectly heat treated or a poor alloy mix many years ago we had some of the main harness rings would start to go oval as they were being pulled so if you had that happening you could cut them off and this was a replacement ring that you could basically fit in the field without needing to have a harness machine um, wish we could still get these parachute to france again made a mini ring with the same sort of concept in the unlikely event of a riser failure if it happens to be the riser that has your RSL connected it's not going to be so good for you okay if your riser failed in this case on the left hand side off it would go you'd find it really quite inconvenient bit of a giveaway 
uh, you've got a problem it's going to be quite apparent so when you cut away as you cut away the right hand rise is going to go the RSL in this case the skyhook system is going to activate the reserve if your right hand riser were to fail release prematurely during the deployment because of a misassembly or damage or something happened if this riser was to separate and it started the activation of the reserve and the left hand riser is still connected it's not going to end well for you that's why this system here has what's called the Collins lanyard as the riser with the RSL goes the first thing that happens is the cable for the left hand side is automatically released okay so before the pin is fully extracted the cable for the left hand side is pulled thanks to the Collins lanyard with this split housing for the Collins lanyard notice the distance we have here it's substantial why to allow a nice gentle pull with least resistance there are some manufacturers out there who have ticked the box to say they have one of these assembled but you'll find the gap between the housings is a lot smaller in some cases only big enough to fit the tape so in a high load malfunction with a cable that's not been properly lubricated the resistance felt here will be substantially more and you might be trailing your parachute via the RSL the safety system ends up being not that some of the splits are here other manufacturers discovered by having such a sharp angle on their equipment this is a nice gentle curve other manufacturers had a very a brutal change in angle here they've redesigned and moved it down here seems to work a lot better on those compared to the sharp angle this is a nice gentle one so why was the Collins lanyard introduced the Collins lanyard designed by an engineer that worked for Bill Booth at the time in relative workshop called Collins came up with this very clever solution that's the original Collins lanyard what happened in tandem unfortunately had a very nasty incident where the tandem master died the passenger apparently did live but what had happened was after landing the canopy falls on the floor the riser pivots forward and we have what's called a, a flip through the can the equipment was put down was packed picked up for the next load no pre-flight inspection was made the equipment was jumped like this uh, during the main deployment the three-ring system obviously is not able to do its job right so the riser failed and it was the riser with the RSL on it the reserve activated entangled with the main canopy still hanging on the left-hand riser and uh, the descent was rapid so Mr. Collins the engineer had a nice simple solution keep it as simple as possible he came up with this for the tandem they could pop it in an envelope and send it to everybody in the world with a, a vector tandem the TV 13s slipped onto the riser came down of course your tandem has a handle on the outside because you need to gain access with the passenger in the in the middle of you and that was it nice and simple I would safety tie this into place with the cotton thread but if you had a similar situation where your right hand riser was to fail and I'll just simulate that by pulling the cable out in this case if your right hand riser separated as it went it would basically rip the cable out from the left hand side and you would have left hand riser released if the right hand riser failed before the reserve was activated brilliant after this they realized well let's make it for everybody and introduce it to the sport equipment student equipment 
And of course, with the handle on the inside, they had to come up with a different solution. And uh, that resulted in the split in the housing at the back here. With a modern sport vector, in this case a student vector, you can hardly recognize that there's a Collins lanyard fitted to this Skyhawk system. At the risk of turning this into a non-pharmacological intervention for insomnia, uh, evolution, the development of the RSL Collins lanyard section, why is this changed? since the original. Now that's a tandem skyhook lanyard. The cable used to run through here. Okay, and it was changed. The modification added a split to the RSL. At the same time, a staging loop was added. <laughs> Reintroduced from the last century, the staging loop. Why was this added to the tandem and to the sport equipment, the split RSL and staging loop? It's there to save lives. After a tandem went very low in drogue flight and uh, eventually realized it was time to open the main parachute as they activated the main deployment, the main started to deploy and uh, the AAD cut the loop. So the reserve pilot chute leapt out. Now the main was almost fully open, but the container was open. The free bag probably fell out with gravity. If you imagine the free bag falling down in this direction, and pulling on the skyhook, the Collins lanyard gets activated and it released the left hand riser and uh, two people died. So how can we stop this incident from happening again? Well, don't jump with an AAD that cuts the loop when you're opening very low. Uh, don't jump with an RSL, another fan. Let's introduce two things. The split RSL, so instead of the cable for the left-hand riser running through here, they move it across. And if the same incident happened again, and the hook was jerked on by a reserve deployment bag going down towards the ground with gravity, it would not release the left-hand riser. We still need it to be able to work when it's properly orientated. So if the RSL is pulling from this orientation, it releases the left-hand riser before activating the reserve. And because they were after belt and braces safety system, they reintroduced the staging loop. And that consists of a piece of shock cord Okay, the loop, closing loop passes through the cutter and that grommet on flap number one and the shock cord passes through its own individual piece. Now, of course, the reserve deployment bag is inside there and everything's running through. The first portion of bridle is folded and passed through the staging loop. It stages the deployment. This stops the free bag from exiting the container until there's something positive pulling on the bridle, either your reserve pilot chute or the skyhook system, now allowing the bag to leave the container. Many years ago, when we packed reserves that were round, they weren't inside the deployment bag and they'd be essed into the container. And if you were really stable flat, when you pulled the reserve ripcord, the pilot chute would jump out, enter in your burble, and with the container fully opened, the reserve parachute would come out and resemble a jellyfish or an octopus and start engulfing you. So 
the staging loop on the original rig, if I remember correctly, the, the Wonder Hog, the side flaps were the first ones that closed up, and they had the staging loop fitted here. So the pilot chute would need to be pulling positive traction before it released the last two flaps along the reserve to deploy. So that's been reintroduced. Keep it simple, it works great. This now floats around a little bit too much for my liking, so I actually safety tie it here just with a little cotton thread. So that's deliberately practice. Know your gear is a great way of being able to control your gear and yourself. We want to look on the bright side. We don't want to go looking for malfunctions. That's what we're going to pack properly, deploy, stable. But one day it might be thrown up and you have a malfunction. How are you going to cope with that? Okay. How often do you go through your rehearsals? Practicing a hundred times on the ground with your eyes closed is not nearly as useful to you as practicing three times deliberately with full eyes open words for each maneuver. No, So that's a great on the ground. How about practicing in the sky? I'm not saying cut away your parachute. I'm saying exit the aircraft alone watch the horizon take a reference reach back and grab your pilot chute fly like that for a few seconds just to build up your confidence that you can keep a head in control and have your hand on the pilot chute your body's asymmetric you just find out how you compensate to keep flying on a straight line pretend to unlock your handle pretend to launch your pilot chute do a count we need timekeeping don't just Think, oh, it's been an awful long time since I threw the pilot chute. What should I do next? Once you come to the end of your count, you should be looking over your shoulder to see what's going on if there's not a parachute above your head yet. I don't want to look over my shoulder in case I get asymmetric and go unstable. Well, practice. If you're at exit altitude, you leave the aircraft, you pr do a simulation of throwing a pilot chute, you keep a heading, and now after finishing your count, reference your heading, Look over your right shoulder, see what you can see. Come back and, hey, I'm still on heading, great. Look over your left shoulder, see what you can see. Build up your skill levels and your confidence that you're capable of looking over your shoulder without having to tell people who are watching that you were inventing a new freestyle move. Okay, once you've done that, looked over your right and your left shoulder, reference on the horizon again. Now, look at your handles and bring your hands down onto your handles. Whichever technique you're using, they're all good if they're well rehearsed. But if you're doing this or this, of course the surface areas have shifted. So find out what you need to do with the rest of your body to compensate for that change. You might fall off, get back on. You're at 12,000 feet. There's plenty of time to play, okay? So go through your procedures. Pretend to peel the handle off. Pretend to punch it out. Pretend to pull the reserve in free fall. It's not quite the same as spinning under a malfunction, but if you've rehearsed this, like riding a bicycle, you fall off a few times, get back on. You don't run from the bicycle if you fall off once. You're never going to learn that way. Get up there in the sky at good altitude with time to, to uh, with time on your hands, a few seconds at least, and go through simulation of your emergency procedure. Dive out the airplane. If you're diving towards a wingtip, whichever side the door is on, and the horizon is going to be there, your body kicks up onto the relative wind. The horizon looks wrong. People force themselves to be horizontal straight out the door, not understanding relative wind because it's kind of difficult to get their head around it. The wind comes on your back and unstable you go. If you exit and you're on flight line as you sw swing 90 degrees on the exit, the horizon looks way too low. You feel you're falling over backwards, so you force yourself to get horizontal. The air gets on your back and you invent a new freestyle move. Just keep smiling and tell everybody what you're doing is intentional. But use it as skill building techniques, okay? Exit the aircraft and, and learn how to trust your body position, okay? 
I hope you've learned something today and your knowledge on the three ring system and the cutaway handle has been increased. Um, if you have any uh, comments or suggestions, please feel free to leave some in the comments below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you saw it was rubbish, please feel free to tap the thumbs down twice. See you on the next one.